I believe that we are 100% responsible for everything that happens. You want a crystal ball of your future, just look at the choices you're making today. Take responsibility, take what's on your side of the street, and don't overtake responsibility for anybody else. Don't be the superhero because really what you're doing, they're also on this earth to do the best that they can do and you're handicapping them if you overtake responsibility for them. Welcome back to The Medicine Podcast. My name is Mimi and I have my wonderful, handsome, blue-eyed partner in life and love and podcasting with me here. What's going on, everybody? This is Chase. We have a special episode today because we are completing the Picard trifecta of amazing thinkers from this beautiful family. And we have the matriarch with us today, Nancy Picard, life coach. Welcome to The Medicine Podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Well, the first question that we ask every guest on the medicine is, what do you love in your life? What aspect of your life do you love so much that you wish you could gift it to every human? It's my balance between work and play. So I work out about, I'm outside two or three hours every single day, seven days a week. Wow. And I... I don't let anything get in the way of that. And that's my play. That's my socialization. That's my endorphin high. And um, I'm lucky enough to be able to carve out my work and play that way and live in amazing places so that it's all there waiting for me. And where do you live? I live mainly in Aspen, Colorado, and then in um, Mill Valley, Marin, outside of San Francisco. Oh, wow. Amazing. So both places are just waiting to be outside to play. Yeah. Great. I love that. And and I know that's been a huge, you know, it's like I want to want that, but I'm still working through the programming of this productivity, efficiency, hustle mentality that I that I kind of was raised through and started my career in, which is like, if you're not producing, you're not, you're not optimizing life in some way and, and to rewire that that idea that you have to be working constantly and that it's not you know quote unquote productive to spend time in nature and to spend time recharging your batteries and connecting to something that lights you up um it, it's it's a hard transition for so many of us who grew up in kind of the western uh, model of being productive and successful to transition into yeah but i think you have to just redefine what does productive mean to you like to me um, nurturing my inner soul, you know, nurturing what makes me feel good is going to make me more productive in the hours that I'm working. You know, it's like I, I used to think you had to be a stay-at-home mom and be with your kids all those hours, right? Well, the moms that actually work when they are home, they're really one-on-one -on -one with those kids. They're not pushing them off or not really giving them your attention. So it's not how many hours you're at something slaving away. It's how do you make yourself more productive so that when you are working, you're at your best, but you've also have joy in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for for embodying this and, <laughs> and communicating it uh, to us. Much needed for me, as always, to hear it. So maybe before, you know, want to get into your journey and unpack your journey a little bit. Uh, but first, uh, for everybody listening, maybe you could summarize uh, what you do in the world today. Give us a little context. Okay. So... Um, I have an internationally best-selling book called Bigger, Better, Braver, Conquer Your Fears, Embrace Your Courage, and Transform Your Life. And it's it's a step-by-step -step book on how to do what I do with my clients. So for those that don't want to get a coach or can't afford a coach, it's a great first step. That's why I made it, so that there's something for everybody. Generally, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do do group coaching on you know the blueprint relationship and different, bigger, better, braver. I have different um, coaching programs out there, but I'm either doing one-on-one -on -one or I'm doing marriage and relationship coaching, and then it's two-on-one. -on -one. And um, the relationship and marriage coaching is through relational life therapy with Terry Real. I don't know if you know about him, but anybody out there should know about his work. It's amazing. 
and it it's, will save marriages and relationships all over the world. So I've that's what I do. That name. I've heard, yeah. I've heard that name. Terry, is it Neil? Real. No, Real. Real. R-E-A-L. So he has um, Fierce Intimacy, which is an audible and sounds true. He has the new rules of marriage, and he has a new book um, called Us. It's something else, like when you and I become us or something, but they are all phenomenal. And that's what my my marriage and relationship work is all about. So, wow, that's amazing. And when did you start this wor- work? What in your life led you to help people in this way? Well, I used to own a personal training gym. And so for 16 years, I worked with people's outer fitness. And I was like a, a you know, a, I was just like a sweat bitch. You know, I was really. <laughs> You know, all they had to do is work in the do- walk in the door, and I was in control. And I just worked them. I had men vomiting outside, and like I just that's that's how I rolled at the time. And um, and then I got divorced after a really long marriage, and then I had another serious relationship breakup. And so I finally realized, like, there's something I'm not learning here. There's something the universe wants me to know that I'm. I don't know, you know, I don't want to be here a third time. So I got myself a Healing Your Heart coach, which was a Debbie Ford coach, which was the first thing that I I did. I'd already moved to Aspen. I wasn't, I didn't work for nine years. I just, I overplayed, I overexercised. I ended up getting melanoma from overexercising and I've had fatigue, you know, um, adrenal fatigue recently, you know, in the last, like six or seven years ago, I'm an over-exerciser. And so I am like the opposite of a lot of people. I really have to control, I have to set boundaries around how much I exercise, like literally boundaries around it so that I don't over-exercise. Um, but that's what started me. So I, you know, as a as a fitness coach, you're already working with people's inner belief systems and helping them and listening to their problems. So when I first got a coach, I really realized that there was so much, I had a lot of skills I wasn't utilizing. You know, I couldn't just play all day and I needed to get back into the real world and give back and use my my voice and my courage and my mindset to help other people. And it started slowly, but I have you know, now I'm a master coach and I, I teach other coaches to become coaches. And I just, I keep adding tools to my toolbox. And the whole marriage and relationship has just been the last two years. I just don't, you know, people say what's next. And it's like, whatever comes in my face is, is what's next. I don't, I don't have a blueprint for what's next. Just that I say, yes, you know. I love that. I love that you're, you have that relationship with your intuition and you're like, open to take on more and say yes to the things that, you know, seem to be lighting you up at the time. And just to, um, you know, uh, identify with you a little bit here, you're, you're talking to two people that have definitely been through uh, a hormone hell hole due to overexercising in our early 20s. Um, I'm not sure if you know uh, much about our story, but we were childhood sweethearts, married very young in our early 20s. We were together, married for three years, and then we actually separated and divorced. And one of the things, it wasn't the thing, but one of the things that contributed to our disconnect that led to divorce was our over infatuation with external factors and having some sort of control in our life and and that control being around food and exercise and kind of what you look like from the outside. So you are in good company. We totally understand that. Um, And we've had to implement the same sort of like boundaries with over exercise, certainly chase more than me, but um, you're, you're, you're in good company here. We totally get it. Yeah, I'm curious for you um, because it, it took breaking it, it took breaking myself physically to get interested in self development. You know, some level of spiritual connection, some level of real high dream or purpose for my own life. What did that look like for you? It, it seems like you know maybe there was this this health hurdle that kind of cracked the door on a more 
um, holistic and pervasive way to heal oneself from, you know, from the inside out. How did that, how did that process yeah. work for you? Well, it's interesting because we don't recognize the signs when they first come, right? right. Yeah. So it's like the universe has to keep giving you bigger and bigger examples and problems till you lessons until you learn them. But there was a time when I saw Paul Chuck and um, he said to me, you're burning, your, you look amazing. He said, like women your age don't look like you, but you're burning yourself out from the inside out. And I thought, oh, you're full of shit. Like, that's just not true. <laughs> and then a few years later, I got melanoma and I flew to New York and because I was already living in Colorado and I had a big surgery on my leg and I went to Jason's to recover and he sent me his, his meditation coach at the time. And she comes in and she sits down next to me, you know, her very soft voice. And she says, isn't it amazing what the universe had to do to get you to stop? Mm. Wow. And in that moment, I thought, seriously, you think the universe has something to do with my getting cancer? Like, you're just in la-la land. <laughs> and so I still didn't believe her, but... If you don't listen to your body, your body doesn't listen to you. And it was a real wake-up call for me that um, not everything is good for you. And too much of a good thing is too much of a good thing. And so, I mean, for those nine years that I wasn't working, I mean, my working so hard and working out all the time when I owned the gym, nobody noticed, Right. It was part of what I did. Mm -hmm. And I was a marathon or a, you know, a century bike rider and some mini triathlons. And that was all okay. But when I moved to Aspen and I wasn't working anymore, then that was my only social outlet. I could hike for a couple hours and ski for a couple hours and still go to yoga. And I just was exhausting myself without realizing it. I actually need to work so that I don't work out too much it's yeah. like it's sick and so i stopped over exercise and i had this like two event rule you know i wouldn't do more than two different activities and then when i was turning 60 i decided to go climb mount kilimanjaro and that gave me a new excuse mm. to overtrain because now i had something i was working mm -hmm. for a goal yeah a goal and I, I, tr I overtrain. I went to Thailand and did a bike trip, and I went to Vietnam a couple week months later and did a bike trip. And I just, I overdid, I overdid, I overdid. I did Kilimanjaro. And by the time I came back, I was full of, um, I had adrenal fatigue. I had all kinds of parasites, and I mean, I just had everything that could possibly be going on in my system going on, and so. If it ever happens to me again, then I, that wasn't, I still didn't learn, you know? I mean, that's on me. In this little cup, I have my favorite way to enjoy mushy love, which is in combination with cold milk. We drink raw cow's milk and I put it uh, about eight ounces of milk in with about a scoop and a half of mushy love. That combination, like the cold version of mushy love, tastes like liquid graham crackers. Like, I shit you not. If you don't know yet what Mushy Love is, it's our mushroom elixir with 500 milligrams of chaga, which is amazing for gut support. They call it the king of mushrooms. And then 500 milligrams as well of tremella mushroom, which is the beauty mushroom. And she is most known for holding 500 times her weight in water. The more hydrated we are, the more plump and dewy and fresh and young our skin looks. Mm, plump and dewy. <laughs> For Mushy Love, go to getmushylove.com and you can use the code MEDICINE for a nice little discount that we only give to our medicine podcast listeners. Yeah. And, and that, what you're saying, you know, I know so many people can resonate with, maybe it's not exercise, but it could be something else in life, things that we attach ourselves to, or I mean, we attach our identity to this thing that is 
good. But like you said, too much of a good thing is still too much. And we've tried to incorporate and talk about on the podcast this concept of not too much, not too little, which is like the most basic (laughs) proverb in the world, you know, uh, and this, you know, balance that we need. And, And you started out talking about that's what you wish you could gift to yeah, everybody is, else. Yeah. Balance. So how are you really helping your clients with this when you also have to, you know, coach yourself every day? What does that mm-hmm. look like for for you and and the clients that you work with? Well, what's interesting about that is that I don't have a lot of clients that are over exercisers, right? You know, I mean like I I'm still working with them to get them Mm -hmm. moving more and doing more than less. So that's not really it. But, but the other thing you said about, you know, we tie our ship basically to how athletic we are or how successful we are. I work with my clients a lot on self-worth and that there are three ways of feeling worthy that are all losing strategies. So banking on, you know, the material things that you own or your accomplishments or how other people see you, all three of those are losing ways to feel good about yourself. Because the moment somebody doesn't see you as worthy, you don't see yourself as worthy. You know, if you're a lawyer or a doctor, when you stop being a lawyer or a doctor, now you don't feel worthy anymore. Now, now what am I? So if you can, I try to get my clients to have their self-worth be intrinsic. You are worthy because you're on this earth and you breathe and nothing else. You know, and so I work with people's inner child to help them rediscover that they are worthy just for being on this earth. They don't have to be anything. They don't have to prove their worth. And so that's, that's where I go. You know, that's the balance that I'm looking for. Let's start with feeling worthy. And then you can basically do anything and be anything. Mm-hmm. It's so important. We we have this habit of accumulating or achieving and building this resume of identity so that we can be able, you know, when, when shit get, hits the fan and we're questioning uh, who we are and our purpose, we can look through the resume and we can look right. at the accomplishments and we can say, okay, I'm, I'm this person yeah. who got the accolades and the trophies and the money. And, you know, I never, I work out six days a week. I never, I never miss it. And, but life is chaotic and the environment is chaotic and there will be elements of surprise and unpredictability that will impact your ability to complete the, the, the formula with which you've defined yourself. Right. And as that shakes and as that breaks and you have these moments of the resume being blank, and you now wonder who you are. If you've never spent time looking at yourself on the inside, if you haven't s- spent time connecting with these more innate nudges towards something, you know, a lot of times we go back to childhood because we we have gravitated towards something as children prior to being programmed uh, towards something else that that are more indicative of our you know natural uh, expression of of life and vitality and purpose. And so I, I love that you're doing that. How are you getting people to, because it can seem very esoteric to have a relationship with oneself. And what does it look like when you're working with someone and you're communicating these this idea of connecting with your intuition or having a relationship with yourself and self and loving oneself? What does that process look like when you're when you're working with someone to to kind of Put, bring that this idea down to earth in a practical sense. Mm-hmm. You no, know, I work with a lot of um, young women in their thirties and forties who want a partner, they want a marriage, they want the baby, and they come to me, and I will basically say, "You have got to become the person you want to attract. You have to love yourself." so that you, somebody else will love you in that way. You have to exude your self-worth so you will attract somebody who also has their own self-worth. And to do that, 
I help them rewrite like what they think they need to be in a relationship. And then it starts with self-love and self-trust and making yourself a priority. So I teach these women, more women than men um, at that age, that their voice is important, their needs are important, to stop being a people pleaser and a conflict avoider, an overgiver, an overdoer. And so that's all about learning for the first time. What do you need? What do you want? What is your voice telling you? So I bring it up that way. That's how I help them work on themselves. Half the time, they don't know why they're a people pleaser. You know, what happened in their childhood or what are they modeling or what are they reacting to that makes them that way? And historically, women really believe that love and life means putting other people in front of them. We, we're in a one-down position from the beginning. And I help bust that whole thing, you know. And I, that's why I love working with 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds because don't wait till you're 60 to learn those lessons. Learn them now. And so when you find your mate, you're already going to be in a relationship where you know you're worthy and your voice matters as much as theirs. So you can hold yourself in warm regard and hold them in warm regard at the same time. Mm, that's, yeah. that's the work. Can, yeah. Can you go into the importance? And, and this stood out to me as I was, you know, doing a little research before the show on on some of the things that you you teach and embody. Um, and one of them was taking responsibility of one's life and circumstances. And um, can you go into how important that is to make progress and to shift? Because I think, and even in my own story, post our divorce, you know, as I was having. Uh, health issues and ha as I was having purpose issues and wondering, you know, what I should do. I had a default the mode to blame my divorce, to blame my dogmatic religious programming that was causing me trauma in my adult life, to blame my employer or the circumstances around me. Okay. And, and it, it wasn't until I just took radical responsibility for the circumstances of my life that I could even begin to think about making progress. So maybe okay. maybe go into that a little bit. Yeah, so I believe that we are 100% responsible for everything that happens, right? We are co-creators. And so many times you get into a relationship with somebody and you're like, he was a sociopath. Like, how can I take any responsibility for that? Or he had this huge crisis and that's not on me. I did the best I could do. But sometimes it's even just our beliefs that attract somebody into our life that that add to all of that. So if I can get you to understand that you're 100% responsible for the things that you do and the say and the choices that you make and that every choice matters and that like you want a crystal ball of your future, just look at the choices you're making today. And so for somebody like me who trusts in me, Learning that I'm 100% responsib responsible is like, whoa, that's great. Because if, if I'm in charge, I know I'm going to get it done. If I have to rely, if I'm the victim and I have to rely on other people to, to make my life rock and roll, then I, I'm a victim in it. And so I not only teach people to take responsibility for their own actions and thoughts and, you know, reactions, but I teach parents like, Stop overtaking responsibility for your partner or your children because all you're really doing is enabling them to take under responsibility for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're, you're weakening them. You know, I tell a story that probably on the first day that Jason and Jared went to high school, they forgot something and they called me. Could I come and bring it? And I did, which meant that I was bringing them stuff for eight years. <laughs> And I did, you know, I didn't have these tools then. And so I say that, like, if I had just said to them on day one, like hard love, hey, dude, think about it next time, you know, and bring your stuff. Cause this is not, I'm not doing this anymore. And they would be way better at that than they were. <laughs> and so those are the kinds of things I say, take responsibility, take what's on your side of the street. And don't overtake responsibility for anybody else. Don't be the superhero 
because you really what you're doing is you're you're they're they're also on this earth to do the best that they can do and you're you you're you're handicapping them if you overtake responsibility for them mhm yeah yeah i think we're we're seeing that a lot at least as i perceive it in the world with um sort of the younger generation right now certainly not all but it seems like this younger generation that has grown up with cell phones and instant gratification and entertainment at all times that there is this sort of overarching feeling of entitlement or lack of responsibility and i know i'm speaking generally but it's it's something that i'm observing and reflecting on for our future child knowing that like there i'm sure there is this balance for mothers where you want to provide and you want to empathize and you want to you know give them everything to to flourish in life but again we're coming back to the not too much not too little and then it's like right? provide the tools and then there has to be this sort of separation point where you kind of push them out of the nest a little bit and see if their wings work. And, yeah. you know, have I taught them enough tools to really navigate in the world as a contributing, loving, intelligent member of society and just being able to reflect on what's going on out, out there. And then, you know, being reminded almost on a weekly basis by talking to people like you, it's like, I'm, I'm realizing how important and how valuable that needs to be for us as parents to like have that not too much, not too little balance in the, in the way of responsibility and, and teaching the child. And I just, I don't know if it's, if it's happening as much as it should be. No, I agree. I, I talked to my parenting clients, um, let them sail, let them fall. Stop congratulating them on how smart they are or that they won the game and be like, what did you do today that was bigger, better, braver? Mm. What were you afraid to do and you did it anyway? That's what I want to talk about. Or talk to them about, I tried this today and I, I wasn't good at it, but I'm really proud of myself for trying. What did you try today that you weren't good at? You know, so start to change where you're complimenting them. And then also, I even watch it with my grandkids. You have to like kind of put your hands behind your back sometimes to not do the thing for them because yeah. you you can do it so much faster or they're struggling and just let them do it and however they do it, don't try to fix it for them. It's yeah. hard. It's hard. It's, it's, hard. It's, it's inconvenient, you know, and in, in, in a world of like, especially with a lot of working parents where both are working or, or they're, they're one of them is managing a large family and it's, it's to-do lists and sports and clubs and getting them to school. And there's this just massive checklist and it's actually more efficient just to like hold their hand through something or guide them through something than yeah. the inconvenience of letting the environment be the feedback mechanism that they need to, to, to know how to work through that level of resistance. or Yeah, trip. I hear you. And me, I agree with you. There is a there is a good sized contingency of failure to thrive twenty year olds out there, and there's a lot of reasons. And some of it is the hormones. You know, so much plastic, and the boys have no testosterone, and so they have no passion, and they have no they don't even notice that they have no passion, or they never get in a relationship because they don't have a job. They're living at home. The women are much more usually productive than that. So they they don't even try. Porn is totally accessible and so much easier than having to try to please a woman. So there's so many contributing factors that go into their failure to thrive. And they're living at home. And, you know, there's always this thing with the parents that, oh, you know, you don't you don't want them to kill themselves. You don't want them to get too depressed. It, mm -hmm. It's such a fine line that it's a it's an epidemic of more male than female, but it's there for both failure to thrive. Yeah. You know, failure to launch is really what it is. It's not failure to thrive. They're just, yeah. I, I work with these like 25 year old boys and I, it's like, pull, I, 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 it's pulling teeth, you know, they don't even see anything wrong with it. Right. 
Yeah, I, I, it's a, it's a, even in my generation, kind of the millennial generation, you, you saw this, uh, you know, porn was very easily accessible, probably for my generation, first time ever, you're not going to the gas station, you know, to get the magazine right. behind the, or stealing your and, mom's JC Penny catalog. Right, right. You're, you're, <laughs> you're it, more easily accessible uh, by the, right. time, the high school and everything. And, and I've just seen it get worse and worse and worse to the point that it's a natural and normal thing for not just men to have in in their life but even in committed relationships it's just a thing it's kind of right. like having a hobby on the side you know and yeah what you hear is yeah everyone does it it's normal yeah right and and then and then everything with the hobbies and um things of of personal habit are not a natural connection back to our conversation to, to begin the podcast which is this connectivity to nature things that are natural where it's a it's a balance and it's a synchronization with the rhythms of life itself when you're connecting to nature and you're reestablishing an energetic expression of yourself that is more in tune with the natural environment and when you consume sex in an unnatural state through pornography when you are interacting with tools that have plastics all over them and when you're consuming light that is not full spectrum and doesn't have the the diversity that can you know enable the the expression of hormones naturally throughout the day like nature and sunlight right. do you 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 find yourself so disconnected from even having a chance at back to your point earlier getting to know yourself taking responsibility because you're living in this this simulated world disconnected from from nature itself yeah and then the, and then you bring in for these boys date rape and how easy it is to have your life ruined right why bother you know just why even go go down that road and and it's surprising to me how many boys have no interest they mm -hmm. just don't date at all yeah, yeah. I, I heard a statistic recently uh, from Jordan Peterson, and he he said that globally, there is the lowest incidence or rate of sexual behavior amongst, I think it's 18 to 30 year olds that there ever has been, not even like porn and masturbation, like nothing at all. Yeah, People, there's less and less drive, it seems like to seek this out, this sexual connection. Um, and, you know, some people, I don't know, might argue that, oh, it's a good thing that there's less, you know, teen pregnancies. And of course, that's an awful thing. And, you know, most of the time, and I wouldn't like wish that on any teenager necessarily. But the thing behind the thing is that there's less drive to seek it out, to seek that connection, which is totally normal for a teenager whose hormones are coming online and they're getting curious and they're wondering and they're becoming, you know, more intrigued by the opposite sex. Like if that's not happening, that's really scary. Like that's, I, I it's easy for me to kind of be overwhelmed with anxiety when I think about that getting worse and worse and worse. And it's like, where does it end? Yeah. Well, I think that the hormone and the low testosterone is a big part of that. Like I, I, I uh, Boys Adrift was the book that I read. Can't remember who wrote it now, but he said that the testosterone level of twenty-year-old boys today is the same as men at 50, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I've heard similar statistics, and and of course the default is to you know in your twenties treat that with, you know, hormone therapies, um, instead of exhausting the natural resources. So I'm curious in, in your opinion, and it sounds like you're working with young men as well too. How are you coaching them through this? If, if you've got, let's just say the, the archetypical younger man, who's got low testosterone, low drive purpose, maybe some level of depression or anxiety to go with that. How are you coaching them? Well, first of all, I have to admit, that out of all the different groups that I coach, they're the hardest mm. because, because they don't see anything wrong. Like, so when I say, well, so don't you want to be dating? You know, or it's been two years that you've been looking for a job. Like, what else can we do? You know, and I mean, to add another thing we haven't even talked about 
those that graduated during the pandemic, they really missed the boat. Mm -hmm. They've been home for two years. They've been isolated. Their drive is gone. And, and they're not getting recruited in college. They missed it. They really did miss it. And so part, sometimes I think they need to go back to college. Like, could you get another degree? Maybe we need to get you back in the last place you've been where you really have passion and drive and, you know, because we've been doing this for two years and you, you don't have a job. I always have their testosterone checked. Mm, that's great. And I'm always surprised when it comes back that it's okay. Because my thought is, really? <laughs> I thought that was going to be a no-brainer. Like, I thought, you know, that's it. We're going to fix that. And I don't know. It's it's so, I, so what I do with them is I just give them actionable steps. I try to become their accountability partner. I hold them to a higher standard than they hold themselves. But again, you can only work as hard as your clients are working. If they they don't see a problem, it's kind of hard to push them. Mm -hmm. And but I do anyway because that's who I am. And I've had you know my boys were never like that, so I I don't have a great understanding of. Don't you see the big picture? Like, don't you want to be a functioning adult that has a career and has passions and, you know, oh, I'm not into that. I'm not into that. I'm not into that. You know, then I'll get down to say, okay, how many hours a day are you watching porn? How many hours a day are you playing video games? Like, I will dial down because I already know that's what you've got to be doing. You're not doing nothing for 20 hours a day. What are you doing? Let's just discuss it. Yep. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. I think that your life force energy in a male is sitting there waiting to be invested in something. And even if it's at a really young age, it, there's going to be this drive to invest it into something. And in the world that we live in now, those investment opportunities are so close to our face, the, the bad ones, I should say, the ones that don't return with an ROI. That's that's video games to to an, uh, an excessive degree. I played no. video games as a kid. I think they're awesome to a certain level, but in excess, uh, it's porn, it's consumption consumption of bullshit food. It's not moving your body and it's it's giving into you know comfort, if you will. Investing your chi, your life force energy into those lanes, it's gone. It doesn't come back to you in any way. If you invest them in certain aspects, you know, for for me and and many men that I've seen, it, it can be anything from sports to, um, you know, scouts to these other like really healthy outlets. That even though you're giving your chi and your energy to this, it returns back to you in yeah. a way that was larger than than what you put forth to begin with. And you have that feeling when you lay your head down at night, even as a kid, and you go, damn, I can't wait to do that again. Yeah. Or I know what I want even further from this. And that is where I think once you get that feedback loop, it's just as a guy, as you, if you can get that feedback loop of like, wow, I just worked hard for something and it made me tired. I actually used my energy, but I just got this lift from the feedback from having pursued that thing that is making me, maybe not right now, but tomorrow or next week, more inspired to continue to pursue this. It is it is almost um, contagious in the sense that, and, and addicting in a sense that you just want to consistently feed that, that loop. Um, and I think the more that we can foster what is a huge deficiency in the world right now, which would be um, men to look up to and and true leaders and heroes, which we're at a, a male deficiency uh, of currently. And men are very visual. And if you can visually see somebody living embodied and healthy and vital in that way, and you can start to uh, look up to them in, a, a, as sort of a hero, I think we'll start to see some change. But it's not going to be without a huge collective societal lift because I can't help but see this kind of deteriorating. Yeah, it's really, and it's hard, and it's sad, and it, and the parents don't know what to do. I mean, I have so many friends who are really 
industrious human beings and successful whose kids are not. And so we're doing something. We're giving them too much. We're doing too much. And and they and then they and they don't have it. And I think what you're saying about the chi is really true. And it's hard to get it back for them. Yeah. You know, I don't need, I, I, I don't I don't know how to get it back, to be honest with you, but because they don't it seems like they don't have any passion other than video games. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that there I think there this is multifaceted obviously. There's not just one thing that's causing this breakdown in um sort of chi and life force energy, you know, getting that out there in the world. I think a huge one is this is the first generation who has grown up always having like a cell phone from, you know, age 10 or 12 on and I think that that has really stunted people's ability one to be bored which leads to creativity and new thoughts if you're constantly scrolling and and i'm guilty of this to some degree as well like waiting in line at the coffee shop while i'm bored it's been three seconds let me get out my phone and see if you know there's a day i can answer and be productive even if it's working you know and so i'm guilty of this as well but always having that instant gratification feedback system in your pocket at all times from age 12 on, I think is really handicapping for people. And I have to, we have to manage it even as adults. So how does someone who's 12 or 13 or 14 or 17, when their brain isn't even fully formed yet, how are they going to manage that for themselves or think long-term, you know, enough like that part of their brain isn't even fully formed. Right. So I think, I think the having the cell phone from a young age is such a huge piece of it (laughs) and i'm like man i don't want to get my kid they're having a flip phone until they're like in (laughs) college because it's like you just you're missing out on so much yeah the human by you know being entertained by this this screen all the time it's just i think it's really really detrimental yeah it's changes i mean even for us as adults we're watching a movie and checking our phone or i'm listening to a course, but I'm also on my phone or I'm knitting. It's like I can't just calm myself enough to do the one thing. Yeah. And that's what's happening to our brain. And we didn't even grow up with any of that, right? right. And so think about those kids. It's I, I don't I don't ha- I don't have the answer to that. I think I think that kind of the next phase of this is a more intentional and intelligent protocol or protocols for interacting with these devices and with technology in a, in a healthy way, even if it has to almost be like regulated. I'm not saying by the government, but I'm saying by like family dynamics Parents, practices yeah. and, and, and in the home, having these, these tried and true tested protocols. I think we're kind of in this phase now where it's like, okay, this is a problem. Now we need to start adopting some, uh, some architecture into the dynamic of these, these homes and these kids to, to, come up with this not too much not too little approach because the technology is not going anywhere Mm -mm. but if we don't learn to use it as a tool and instead of being a tool for it uh it's going to be a slippery slope down to um even further depths of loss yeah i agree i mean both of my boys their 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 kids weren't allowed to watch tv or anything until they were a certain age and then they get like even now you know like i have a nine-year-old granddaughter they they have like this hour or an hour and a half where they're all watching the uh, and the good program together, right. and then that's it for the day. And you know they're not sitting at at the movie. They're not sitting at the dinner table with an iPad or watching a movie or doing those things. It's got to start there. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's really no. got to start there. We're, we're and around. it was hard for me as the grandparent who yeah. would get the kids who was who was used to Sesame Street with. You know, and everything, and I'm like, oh god, what am I gonna do? Like, how am I gonna fill up all these hours? You yeah, know, but it's really good for them. Yeah, yeah. We, we we've seen it, you know, firsthand in our life. Paul, uh, Angie, and Penny are dear friends of ours, and their kids are just like more vital than any adult I've ever seen in my life. They're just like athletes at you know five and three three years old, and then yeah. and my sister similarly has a, a a really similar protocol around interaction with technology. I think that the kids have seen like two movies ever. Uh, which may be a little extreme, but these kids, right. they're, they're 
they're yeah. building stuff Athletes outside. Yeah, they're, they're using right. their imagination every day. They're in the dirt. They're barefoot. They're like she lives on a ranch, and you know we see this play out. We have a lot of siblings amongst both of us, and most of our siblings have kids, and it's really interesting to as we do not have kids yet to watch each one of them in their different, they're all different parenting styles with all different rules and approaches to how they mm-hmm. interact with their kids and, and and technology. And it's so fascinating to see, to be able to witness, of course, there's some, you know, nature in there, not just nurture, but to see, oh, that's what happens when you let your kid watch YouTube all day. Okay. So that's what happens when it's sort of balanced. That's what happens when you don't let them watch anything, you know, barely at all. And it's, it's a, it feels like a, a sort of like experiment that's simulation, going on, yeah. a simulation right now. You're watching. I'll take I'm, this from this row and this from yeah. that row. I'm yeah. picking up pieces and gems and, you know, mm-hmm. things that we, you know, I want to focus on, we want to focus on. And man, it's been, it's been really fascinating. Um, but I do notice, you know, for my, my sister, she, she will say like, yeah, we, we uh, took away YouTube and man, her behavior has been, you know, just so much better. And I'm like, huh, you think, no. wow. And like, just like, mm, that's very interesting. Like, <laughs> kind of like, yeah, no duh, but. Anyway, right. she's making progress, but I think I think um, I would love to to kind of transition a little bit to your work with uh, couples in inside relationship. Um, we, you know, on the medicine podcast, we talk a lot about conscious relationship or intentional relationship okay. building, um, and not just with your romantic partner, but you know, with everything, with God, with the earth, with your body, with food, with movement. But having our kind of colorful relationship history and past, we have the really unique fortune uh, to be able to look at what went wrong in part one of our relationship and to sort of course, we've course corrected a lot of things. We've picked up new tools and have a completely new toolbox in this part two. Um, but I'm I'm curious what kind of people, what kind of relationship issues is is common in your work? What are people coming to you with um, in their relationship where, where it's going wrong? I'd say that um, most couples that come to me, one of them is ready to throw in the towel. Mm. And it's usually the woman. And it's usually because the, the husband... Not always. As a matter of fact, I guess that's not really even true. One of them, there's a one up and a one down. There's a blatant and a latent in the relationships. And wait, can you explain that? That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take a regular heterosexual couple, generally, especially an older couple, um, there's like the relational patriarchal belief system that the male, attributes are absolutely more sought after than the females. And now it's not always that the male, physical male, has them. But whoever has the power in the relationship is usually the more aggressive one, the stronger one, the more verbally out there one. And not only are they the one that's kind of more one up, but they also, the one that's one down protects the one that's one up. You know, mm-hmm. like they they don't make it seem as bad as it is. Or the one that's one down, a lot of times, they don't speak their needs. They don't talk about what's not working to a great extent. They bury their needs. They bury their resentment. And then they're done. Mm. You know, and so I try to tell my clients who are in that one up position, you're winning the fight, but you're losing the war. Mm -hmm. You're going to end up alone. And a lot of times, just the voice of being more aggressive will shut down the latent in the, in the situation. And so there's a relational grid and there's like one up. And sort of unbridled self-expression, really blah, 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 aggressive and anger. There could be one up and walled off. Like, 
why bother? I don't even, you're not worthy. This is how I am. This works for me out in the world. Because what works out in the world and, you know, makes you great in your job is not relational and mm -hmm. doesn't work in the relationship. Or you're one down, like love anxious, like love me, love me, love me, do whatever you need to do, just love me. Or you're over here on the left side and you're walled off and I can't do anything right. Like it's up. I'm just, I'm out. I'm done. I can't. Mm -hmm. I'm a loser, you know? My job is to really show them where they are on their grid, help them, let them see what, let them choose first where they see themselves and then where their partners see them and then help them become the same as. So instead of a lot of individualism, I work on relationalism, how to cherish yourself and your partner how to negotiate, how to recognize that relationships are harmony, disharmony, and repair. Mm -hmm. And if you skip the repair, you're done. I mean, I started a brand new couple who, who said, well, they first saw themselves on the grid and they're both walled off, walled off and one up and walled off and one down, very patriarchal up here, doctor, you know, the whole very classic. He says, well, we never fight. We really never fight. And I said, well, you called me, you know, I, I didn't call you. And so not fighting doesn't make it a good relationship. Yeah. And basically what it means is that she doesn't feel safe and you're not hearing her. And so the tools that I teach couples is same as to show them what's not working, to talk about the, there are five losing strategies that we talk about so that we, and we all have different combinations of them, but those losing strategies become the dance. And it's the dance that's my client. It's not that your losing strategy is better or worse than your losing strategy but the pattern of your losing strategies is why your relationship is, is failing. What, what are some of those losing strategies? So you can tell me which ones are yours. <laughs> um, the need to be right. The need to control. Unbridled self-expression. Withdrawal. And retaliation. Hmm. Um, I think my, and, and these are the tendencies in your worst moments. Yes. Okay. So mine is certainly withdrawal. And, um, the first one was the need to be right or the need to control. Those are two. Yeah. The need to be, I, I feel that the need to be right and withdrawal are mine too. I don't really resonate with the, uh, I don't ever, I don't think I try to control you. Um, or I don't lash out verbally or like over express my crazy feelings. Maybe I, ha I have historically, but it's not my tendency. Um, and then I don't remember the last one, but those two. Yeah, definitely for me. What are, what are yours, babe? Yeah, I need to be right for sure. Which is probably where we've butted heads, um, in part one, especially. And, um, need, <laughs> It sounds like I'm hesitant to say it because it you know makes it seem like I'm a control freak or something, but I, I need to control. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, and less about like I need to control her as much as I need to feel like I have control over our life. Yeah. I need to feel like I can pull the levers here and that things are fine and it's complicated, but I've got my eyes on everything and I'm able to, you know, move the strings of the the puppeteering of our life. So as long mm -hmm. as I'm in control and there's nothing outside of this, then we'll be fine. Yeah. So, so first of all, those come, those are your adaptive children. So let me just, I'll do this really quickly, but there are three parts of the brain and this is your limbic system. This is your, everything you do out and out of time, but you know, you walk, you, yeah, I can ski without thinking about it, those kinds of things. But this is all. This is also where your trauma from your childhood is. It's your wounded child, 
And if you've had a lot of trauma, this part is overactive. It's always like, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? You're always looking around. And if you have any of that in your childhood, you want to control the situation because you're the only one that can knows you trust yourself to be in control. Mm -hmm. So you have like a shadow belief that I need to control to be safe. That's a shadow belief. So yeah, that's the orphan child. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. And so I, we I, work on all of that. Yeah. I, you were an orphan child. Yeah. Uh, that's my archetype. I'm not right. an orphan. I have a beautiful set of parents, <laughs> dear friends with. I'm a middle child who um, was very introverted, antisocial, and but and just but just took everything. And I'm, I'm still to this day at 32 years old, um, will isolate and just tell myself, I'll figure it out. I'll do it. I'll make my right, own. Buddy. I don't need anybody else. Yeah. So. It's a losing strategy, number one. It's very non-relational. Yeah. Okay, so then the second part of your brain is the ne is the neocortex. This is your adaptive child. This is the brilliant part of you that learned to adapt as a child to all the wounds, all right? This is this part of you does not care about being intimate or being in a relationship it needs what it knows. I need to control everything to be safe. That's right here. This is your prefrontal cortex. This is the wise adult part of you, the thinking part of you, the rational part of you, the flexible part of you. As long as your whole brain is integrated, you work fine. The moment you get triggered, you flip your lid. You're no longer integrated and your adaptive child is running the show. So in your first part of your marriage, your wise adults probably were never in the room. You lived in your adaptive child. You lived in the part of you that thought it was an adult, but it was a poor imitation of an adult. And so what I do with my clients is, first of all, we praise the adaptive child who was brilliant in all of his adaptations, because you're here today, you did what you had to do to survive, or you, how you interpreted your life, and these are your adaptations. I teach you how to take a pause and how to step back or take a time out. All the tools that I teach you is to get you back into your wise adult so that you can communicate. So those are the tools. My tools are all about helping you uncover the inner child, seeing each other's inner child wounds in front of each other, which is not generally done, but that's how RLT is done. And then teaching you what it feels like to be in the adaptive child and then help you get into your wise adult and then the different feedback loops and things that you do to be more relational. That's what it's all about. Because um, the couples that come to me that, you know, they do love each other and they really don't want out. Um, or one will say, I don't know, I've been really happy, you know. I, I don't I didn't know until now that we weren't doing well because I'm happy. Well, yeah, you're the blatant. Yeah. If you're running the show. Yeah. Harry tells an example of like, you know, a guy gets in with a cigar into the into the elevator and he's smoking a cigar and he's happy and everybody around him is choking to death, but he's happy. That's a blatant. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times the if you're not uncomfortable, you're not questioning if there's change that needs to be had. And if if there's a, a less expressive, more dormant internal turmoil from your partner who who hasn't brought anything to the surface it can go completely uh missed because that, yeah. that individual is is so consistently uh comfortable that they're not questioning whether something in the relationship environment is yeah is um i loved what you had to say about um healing and and praising praising and that inner child expression and I was just talking to a friend the other day and and they were mentioning how having kids they have a son and a daughter now with their wife and witnessing his daughter 
in her young child expression has taught him so much and given him so much empathy for his wife. Yeah. He's seeing the root of, of so many of the adult manifestations of behavior and communication style. And he's able to empathize with the innocence of the child by just looking at his daughter and how young she is. And that so, you know, she doesn't have control over so many of these things at that point that now when he's engaged in an argument with his wife or a charged conversation, he sees and feels so much of the presence of that innocent child. Yeah. And there's just a, a, a layer of empathy and compassion that comes into the dynamic. That's great. That's great. And, you know, this just happened to me recently. I hope it continues to happen. Um, but I started to get into something with my, my fiancé, and he turned around and he huffed off, and what came out of his mouth, I didn't even see a man. I saw a nine-year-old walking off mm. saying what he said. And so I chose in that moment to not engage because I, you know, one of the things that Terry says is that everyone's entitled to be in their adaptive child, but you both can't be there at the same time. So if, point. if you notice one of yours is in there, don't follow him in. You stay in your wise adult self. It's a good day for you, even if it's a bad day for them. You stay in your wise adult self. And then the other thing is think about your your partner's complaints. Like you are a customer service person at Macy's. And if I bring you my broken toaster oven, the customer service person's not going to say, you've got a broken toaster, you should see my toaster. Like my whole oven doesn't work. So when your partner has something on their mind, let them just have it on their mind. Listen. Mm. I, I talk a lot about um, relational, oh my God, I can't think of it, um, generosity. That's like my favorite thing, relational generosity. If what your partner is asking you for does not cost you more than you can give, Give it to them. You live with this person. Mm -hmm. So if the question is who's right and who's wrong, the answer is who cares? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a finite versus infinite games and the relate you know, life in your career and some of these other things can be finite. It can have a win. You can there's an outcome that you can search for. In relationship, there's not an there shouldn't be an outcome. It's about playing and it's about the dance, like you articulated. And that is a very challenging thing to in a world of trying to achieve and get the outcomes that you desire to then shift back into this environment of relationship where there isn't an outcome necessarily. And it's rather just presence and and nurturing this dance and this this play. It is a hard shift that really does take consciousness. It's a, it takes a lot, a lot of work. Yeah. I have something I want to go back to. Just I love this so much that you're talking about, you know, recognizing when your partner is in their adaptive brain. Child, yeah. Yeah, adaptive child. Um, and I'm sure people listening can sort of think of some examples, but how do you how, how can people sort of identify what are some things that we can look for to really identify if our partner is in their adaptive child? Well, you, you, I mean, you can kind of tell when your partner's triggered, right? Their voice gets, you know, they might get stiffer. Their voice gets louder. They're more expressive in their need to be right. That's your adaptive child. So your adaptive child, there's right or wrong. There's no gray. There's no flexibility. Um, you're, you're, they're, they're upset. They're angry or they're withdrawn. You know, I, I have couples who they each go to their cave for the whole weekend, you know, and they're both in their adaptive child. So mm. all of those needing to be right and retaliating and all, that's all adaptive child. Yeah. yeah. So mm. number one, I think a big problem is that there's usually one partner that doesn't really say what's on their mind. They don't, their needs, they grew up, their needs are not important, their voice doesn't matter, why bother, 
I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of having my needs met. And if you don't make your needs met, trust me, your partner's not going to know how to make them. Yeah. You know, the fallacy of if he loved me, he would know is bold. It's bold. You, you don't even know. So yeah. when I get a couple like that, I'm not, I didn't just blame the blatant. I'm like, I, I'm on the latent. Like, he's not a mind reader. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you not only have to get your needs across, but real relational generosity is teaching your partner how to help you be, you know, you want to help them be successful. So like I just had right before you, I just had a session with, with, you know, this a couple and he's like, you know, and he has this need to be right. So she says, my feelings are hurt or my this or my that. And instead of hearing her, he goes into why, why he said what he did, why he does what his need to be right. And I basically said, and then she shuts down. And so then he thinks he's right. He's not right. She just shut down. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, the way to win in this is to stop and take a breath and say, what do you need from me in this moment? Mm. How can I help you? And then the partner has to tell them explicitly, I just need you to listen. I don't need you to be right. I don't want you to explain why you're right. I want you to hear why I'm hurt. Mm -hmm. So it's a boundary violation to tell another adult that their feelings are not viable. Oh, your feelings are wrong. You shouldn't feel that way. That's not allowed. That's not true. And so just listen. Don't fix. Just listen. But learn to say to your partner, Oh, you look like you're really having a bad day or you're upset or I can tell you're upset because you're really not looking at me. You know, how can I help you? What can I do differently? What do you need from me in this moment? That's relational generosity. And then your partner needs to tell you explicitly, like you're talking to a child, how you can make them, how can they feel better? What can you do? How can you help them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it's, it's so spot on, you know, something that took me a long time to learn is that, you know, in a charged conversation, uh, in a relationship, usually there's one individual applying logic to the argument and one individual apply, applying emotion to the argument. And, you know, a lot of times this is male is the rational, logical arg uh, arguer mm -hmm. and, the, and the female is the emotional and to just, communicate without understanding the other person's position of trying to communicate you're you're never ever ever going to get to a place of of resolution and so something that's been helpful for me as we reconciled our relationship is as charged conversations come about if i try to interpret what she's saying with a rational formulaic top to bottom left to right approach i'm going to miss out on what's important and that is the emotions that are coming off for and so rather than focusing and only hyper focusing on the rational because my brain will go that's an inconsistency that doesn't make rational sense not registering you're wrong instead, that's what you're thinking instead I'm I'm, 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 <laughs> it's hyperbole a little like i'm exaggerating a little, but but rather sitting there and, and letting the emotions that are coming off of her resonate in my body and maybe even to the degree that I'm putting myself in her position and ignoring the fact that I'm the the person who's bringing up this charge in her and rather taking a third party perspective of wow look at the 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 sadness or the frustration that's coming off of her and what does that actually feel like and before trying to you know pick apart and audit the words that are coming out of her mouth it's rather a, I'm going to sit in the communication channel that she is communicating from such that I can pick up maybe some of this that's coming my way. No. And I would argue the other way around is quite helpful as well, where it's like, okay, rationally, I can see your argument. I'm, I'm putting this together in my rational brain. It's logical. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, I think there's some maybe some emotion that's missing, and maybe that's where we can meet in the middle. Um, but I really have found that helpful in our reconciliation. And what you're saying brings that you know really up for me in this yeah. kind of domain of charged conversation. Right, I love that. That sounds great, and it's it's sort of like the love languages too. You know, like yeah. we think differently, we need different things. 
if you can just remember that you really love the person you're with and you want to learn to communicate, and it's not about right or wrong, it's about resolution, that's why I like timeouts. Timeouts give everybody a chance to get back into their wise adult self. Mm. And then once you're back there, you will be able to be more rational and probably less emotional and start to ask yourself those questions in your time out. You know, what am I making this mean about me? How can I look at this differently? What do, what do they think? What do I think they're thinking? What do they need right now? What do I tell them I need right now? Once you get into those questions, mm -hmm. you're back in your wise adult self. Yeah. I think another question um, that I've asked myself in, in the long line of questions that you beautifully articulated to sort of self-reflect in that moment when you're feeling triggered or charged, one of the questions for me is, what am I afraid of? <laughs> And because I mentioned that I'm a withdrawer, like I, I shut down when I feel like there's any sort of like verbal or emotional or any sort of like attack for lack of a better word, I just completely shut down. And it, it took me, you know, asking myself that, what am I afraid of? When I'm not speaking, when I'm not sharing my authentic feelings, what am I afraid of? And I'll, oftentimes it's been... I'm afraid that if I show my true feelings, I'll sound silly or I will be perceived as stupid or, uh, mm -hmm. or irrational or that Chase will think X, Y, Z of me. And it's just a loop. It's a negative loop. And sometimes even speaking that to your partner is helpful when you come back together as a wise adult speaking to what is actually coming up in your body that you're experiencing. Hey, you know, like this is not easy for me to express my feelings because I'm afraid that if I do what you'll hear or what you'll see is someone who's silly and irrational. And I don't want you to think that of me. So this is why I shut down. If you don't know where to start, sometimes just sh like sharing what's coming up in your body is really, really helpful. And it, it, it reminds your partner that you're just freaking human and that yeah. we all break down in these places in different ways. And it's sort of allows the opportunity for your partner to empathize with your very human experience and they're having a different human experience whatever it is and and then you get to allow your partner to share like well what's coming up for me right now is this and it's sort of like two wise adults sort of guiding their children their inner children like is okay that? you guys you got to work it out you know you know, hug and make up, like say you're sorry. Like, yeah, yeah. It. And that's, that's, it is really helpful. I, I've found for me. Yeah. So your adaptive child has learned there's a shadow belief that I need to stay quiet. So I don't look stupid. Yes. It's as simple that. as that. And yeah. so like if we were working together and I took you back to where you made that belief, that very disempowering belief that kept you safe as a child, but it no longer is. So adaptive then is maladaptive as an adult. Mm -hmm. Then you can give yourself a new empowering belief that I'm safe to say what's ever on my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm not stupid and I'm safe to look stupid even if, you know, I know who I am. Yeah. You know, you got to love your, I say, you got to love your awesomeness and you got to love your flossomeness. And so <laughs> maybe sometimes you are stupid and that's okay too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're dead on. It, it's, it's spot on. I, I don't know exactly what the moment was. Maybe I could go back and, and connect with it in meditation or something, but I don't know when the exact moment was, but definitely as a child, it was reinforced to, to not rock the boat, to not have too big of emotions, kind of just like tough it out and grind through. This is what we do as a family. And, um, you know, I was the youngest child for, for many years before my parents had more children, but for 10 years, I was the youngest child and it was, um, you know, constantly trying to get my older siblings attention to like, pay attention to me, see that I'm funny and smart and worthy and that, 
you know, you don't need to make fun of me and that like, I'm one of you guys, like that, that kind of feeling. And so there was, there was definitely a lot, not only from my, my parents, but also from my older siblings. And so, um, yeah, that was, uh, definitely. It doesn't have to be one incident. You grew up in a dynamic of my voice doesn't matter. My needs don't matter. You know, I have to be cool to be accepted. All of those things, just from the dynamic of the family you grew up in, is beliefs that you need to get rid of. You need to re- rewrite the, that story mm-hmm. because they just don't have, they, they need to not have power going forward in your adult life, even though they supported you as a child. They no longer support you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely have done that. And um, of course, you know, Chase being as conscious and wonderful as he is, um, every time we do have a charged conversation, which is not often, but when we do and he feels me and sees me, no matter what I'm bringing to the table, it it's a practice. It's not a flip of a switch. You, once you know right. it here, it takes time to sort of permeate through your your tissues and your cells and your memories and everything like that. And so, but every time he shows up and is is seeing and feeling me, um, and I can be however I want. It's it's like practice. And so, just you know, to the listener who's in this as well, like it's not gonna. It might feel clunky the first time or the second time or the third time, but it's just another practice and you have to start somewhere. You have to start. If you change nothing, nothing will change. Right. So if you're in a position where things don't feel good in your relationship, you know, seek, seek help, seek more tools for your toolbox because we know better than anyone, you can fully transform your relationship in not that much time. If both people are willing to put in the work or the the labor of love, I should say. Yeah, and to show up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you both have to be willing to show up. Yeah. And, and that's my next question for you because I think, you know, we get this question a lot in our community. Um, there's usually one individual who is feeling the nudge to to implement relationship work into the dynamic. Usually it's, it's um, the woman in most heterosexual relationships who's the one who's like, hey, I, we need to work on this. And the question that comes up is, how do I get them to enroll? How do I get them to partake in this and begin to apply relationship tools into the uh, marriage or uh, relationship itself? What do you are you hearing that? And and how do you how do you usually follow up with that type of question? There has to be leverage. If there's no leverage, you're not going to get the other person to the table. So if you actually have a latent who wants change but isn't willing to leave the relationship, uh, you don't have a lot of leverage. If there are children, then yeah, you don't want to be passing on the generational drama and trauma to those children. And so a lot of times that's your leverage. But if I'm with a couple that has no children, like if I was working with the two of you right now, the only leverage is that one of you is so unhappy that if the other person doesn't change, I'm walking. Mm. So when I work with couples who don't have leverage or their kids are grown and all out of the house, if I can't empower the latent, I stop working with them. I tell them, you're not relational therapy ready Mm. because if there's no leverage, the blatant is generally happy. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I we have we've asked that question to a few other people in the the relationship space, and I don't think we've had an answer like that. You know, a lot of times it's embody the work yourself, be the change that you want to happen in your relationship, um, which is is also true and beautiful and works. We've seen it work, but I think that if the if the situation is more dire where it's like, I can't physically stand being in this relationship any longer if nothing changes, not so much, hey, it would be really nice if we could get you know into this conscious relationship work or go to a workshop together to deepen our spiritual sexual intimacy. There are different levels to the desperation that someone feels yeah. in relationship. And so I think probably 
correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds like you're working with a lot of couples where it's like, it's this or I'm out. It's it, This is the last stop. This is the last stop on the train for our relationship. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I give that like 75% of the couples that come to me. Um, the couples that come to me that really are not leaving, they just want better communication skills. Those are, that's just like one-on-one coaching. I, I That's easier. I can do that. But you have to get buy-in for the blatant to change. And so, yes, I agree. Be the relationship you want to have. And I say that all the time. You want him to be more, more romantic and more intimate? You be more romantic and more intimate. Start it. Don't wait for him to start. You know how many times it's like, you know, I'm tired of starting. You start it. Like, blah, 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 blah. It goes back and forth. But be the relationship you want to have is really brilliant, and it definitely works, and it depends on where you're going with this. But, you know, if my work, if you've got a blatant, whether it's a male or a female, it usually comes from something you're mirroring or something you're reacting to from your childhood. So if you had a really angry, scary father who had to be right and his way or the highway, and now that's how you are in your relationship with your partner, and I say to you, wow, what's it like to realize you've become the one person you never wanted to become? Yeah, that's potent. What's that like for you? Sometimes that's all it takes. They're like, oh my God. Mm. You know, or what's it like to know that your wife and children are afraid of you? Mm. And all of a sudden, the need to be right and the need to control, you can see it for how it's showing up. Yeah. You're winning the fight and you're losing the war. Your children Mm -hmm. are going to turn away from you. So kids are a really big, you don't want them to be, you don't want them to have those same traumas, you know. You want to be the hero in your generational trauma. You want to be the one that turns, Terry says, and faces the flames of all the fire that's been going from generation to generation so you don't pass it on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I love your like no BS approach. Like you're not, you're not, like it doesn't sound like anyways sugarcoating it and i'm i'm sure there are a lot of people who respond really well to that where it's like they need some tough love yeah yeah you know it's how i was as a personal trainer <laughs> i i haven't really changed my attitude i haven't changed my attitude and that's why this particular work works for me i couldn't be a normal marriage therapist where you sit and you listen and you don't tell them what you're seeing. I that I couldn't do that. Yeah. So wow. joining through the truth is like right up my alley. Mm-hmm. I, I love that. You're a very effective mirror for people. Yeah. No, I love it. And it's it's super needed and effective in a in a world that is focused on butterflies and rainbows <laughs> probably too right. often. Um you know Megan's a child of divorce. We have a divorce. It's so common. You know, it's 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 in your history as well. And, sure. and it's it's not that I think that all divorce is bad. It's arguably the best thing that ever happened to us. But how do you work with folks who do end up divorcing? And how can a healthy divorce look? I actually am not in the business of keeping marriages together. Hmm. I'm in the business of helping them see which is better. Mm. And so, I mean, I've been working with one couple that I literally say to them, oh my God, you guys are miserable. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm having trouble, like, sitting across from you. Yeah. And I'm not attached to the outcome. I'm going to hang up and go spend the rest of the evening happy with my partner. You know? And so you guys have to either... Get your shit together or or let's let's work on splitting this up. And so I and I have split up couples. I don't I don't split them up, but I basically say, I don't I I think you should be done. What do you think? You know, that's just 
the story I'm telling myself sitting on this side of the table. And if that's a decision you're going to make, because there's a lot of stable ambiguity. Couples can be miserable for years, but n- but nobody's willing to be the one to pull it. And I'll be like, I, I'll call it, you know, I can call it. I'm the death here. And then let's work on how to get you out with the least amount of anger and resentment so that, you know, you're not the bad guy and you're not the bad guy. Let's agree that this needs to end together. Mm. And then how are you going to parent your children in a really loving, compassionate way? Which is not easy either, but, you know, you know, that's what you want. You want to keep your children as, as whole as you can. And people who stay together thinking that they're doing the right thing for their children, number one, what happens is that you become enmeshed with them. That makes a, a love with, uh, you know, a, a love avoidance because they're going to, they've been enmeshed with one of their parents and then they become an adult and now they feel suffocated the moment somebody needs them too much Mm. because they lived it already. So I will say to them, this is what you're going to, this is what you're doing to your children right now. You guys are miserable and you're both putting everything into your child and you're going to make him or her feel like he's too special. So you're giving him false superiority and that's not good either. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, your children should be your children. They shouldn't be your love interest. They shouldn't be, you shouldn't be feeding off of them. Right. Right. So it's complicated. Yeah. You know, in in my household, my parents are still married, um, but relationship challenges were taboo to talk about it, but everybody felt them. How are you, when you, when you're working with couples who have kids, how how are you encouraging them to communicate their relationship work with the kids? Like, how can it be as healthy as possible for young kids to know that their parents are dealing with relationship challenges and mm-hmm. seeking help without <clears throat> it being quote unquote traumatic? Just by being honest, you know, we're having some difficulties, but we love each other and yeah, we love our family. Yeah. <laughs> and we really want to stay together. <laughs> and so just like, I get you a, a basketball coach. We're getting a coach, you know? We're looking for support to help us communicate better and be better and don't make it a scary thing. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I think that that's um, really important. Something that you said at the very beginning of this is the the harmony, disharmony, which will happen inevitably, no matter how beautiful your mm-hmm. relationship is, no matter how freaking conscious you are, disharmony will happen. Right. Then the next phase is repair. And I grew up, I'm sure Chase did as well, with, you know, never seeing the repair between your parents. So you as a chi- I as a child would witness my parents blow up at each other or yell or you could just feel that the room was frozen with tension and nobody wanted to say a word because they're pissed at each other and you think like am I gonna am I gonna be you know on the receiving end of this anger or this frozenness if I speak up right now and say anything but you never we I never saw them fix anything I never saw them repair anything so like as a kid, you don't know the next day what happened in the bedroom or the conversation. Right. You know, they maybe they repaired, but maybe they didn't, and they're still pissed at each other. Like it's so I wish I could go back or put this on a billboard for every parent that's like, you think you're protecting your child by staying together in the disharmony or, you know, not showing that repair or you know thinking that they're they're not you know attuned to what's going on they don't have any idea they know they know yeah, they pick I up know. on it they're sensitive beings probably more sensitive than the adults in the room they know and you're not helping them you're not protecting them i certainly wasn't protected by 
my dad and stepmom, you know, who stayed together for 20 years in disharmony. It's just like, I wish I could put that on a billboard for every parent out there. Yeah. No, that's great. Also, you know how many clients you hear say, I would put the blanket over my head so I wouldn't hear them fight? Yeah. Well, my clients will say to me, we never fight in front of them. No, you don't. But if you don't think they hear you anyway, yeah, yeah. they do. Yep. Or just feel the energy. energy. All of the above. They don't see you rolling on the floor and hugging and kissing. They only see them kissing the child. They don't see any of that. And I'd rather you guys are with different people and at least one of you will end up in a loving relationship that they can see. Yeah. 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 That's such a good point. Yeah. No, it's so true. And, and, you know, we're, we're the test case for then mirroring the relationships that were modeled to us in our marriage. And I'm you know grateful that we've had this journey and we're able to kind of look back on this and pull the threads of like correlation back to the relationships that, you know, not just in your, your with your parents, but the relationships in your community, especially in ours and in, in evangelical Christianity, there's all these sort of like very impactful marriages and relationships that really imprint um, the 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 gender roles and dynamics of what relationship needs to look like, and and you get to see where those buttons are pressed, and just you know when you're young and when you're in your twenties, especially, and you've you're brand new in marriage. We got we rushed into it, and um, you don't know that you've got this this husband button to that's pressed until you get in your first argument when you're married, and then all of a sudden you sound like that you know, adult male who was impactful in your life. And you're like, holy right. shit, that was just automatic. And that's, I think why, you know, you brought up earlier, it's so powerful when you're like, Hey, so you want to be like that, you know, narcissistic yeah. asshole that was so prevalent yeah. in your life. You can picture a day when you said to yourself, I never want to be like that. Yep. And you remember that day? Oh yeah. What's it like to know that you've become exactly that? And that's, you know, Terry says a lot of times that's it, you know, that's powerful. It's, yeah. in one step that's, they never, they get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They get it. I mean, I think it's really powerful to recognize that loving a good fight and having to win and be right has made your wife want to leave. Yeah. And so you're winning all these little fights. And you're losing the war. Because mm -hmm. you're not right. She just doesn't want to fight. She doesn't feel safe fighting you. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a that's such a good way to put it. Um, because I know that there are a lot of people right now listening who might be the blatant or the latent and they have a tendency to, tendency to shut down or their partner shuts down and you feel like for a second, like, oh yeah, I feel good. I won. They're quiet. I got them. But it, it it feels good for a second and then it doesn't, you know, right. the, the stretch of time that it feels awful and the, the reality that you're creating lasts so much longer than that moment of I won. And that's, you know, something that I talk a lot about is like, we are constantly creating our relationship and the environment and the soil with which, you know, our relationship grows out of. It's like, what are you planting in the soil every day? Like, is it rich and beautiful or, or is it like dead and dirty and, and, and dusty and like no life happening in there? Like we have to be investing seeds into our relationship. And, and, and sometimes that is saying it's simple. This is a lesson that I had to learn in our marriage, saying sorry first and meaning it. That was a huge one for us because I, we both want to be right. And if one person thinks I did nothing wrong, I have nothing to apologize for, <laughs> then it, it makes apologizing really, really hard. But that's something that's, it, it's uh, so simple that it gets overlooked. Just say sorry first and start the repair process first. Don't always wait for your partner to start the repair process. That is a huge lesson that I've learned and I'm, I'm still learning. We all are. We are learning that one. And the other thing is, this is, can be a little controversial, but you can apologize for hurting your partner without apologizing for the action. Mm. You may not really be sorry for the action, 
I mean, I'm not saying that you should do this, but let's say you had an affair. Well, the affair was fun. You had great sex and you had a great time. And it was new and exciting and all the things that make affairs, why people do them. Maybe you're not sorry you did that, but you certainly are sorry that you hurt your partner and that you messed up the marriage. Those are things you can always be sorry for. And so sometimes I may apologize that my partner is upset. I'm really sorry you got, you're upset. Or I'm really sorry that your feelings are hurt. But in the back of my head, I'm thinking, but I'm not really so sorry for what I said. <laughs> and so I don't say I'm sorry for what I said because I may not be. Yeah. 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 You're just, it's just, um, it's just 100% honesty is what you're saying like yeah if you're not actually sorry for the thing then then don't admit to being sorry if you don't really mean it right but you certainly are sorry that your partner is upset yeah yeah that's that's being honest i really am so sorry you're upset how can i make you feel better what can i do to make you feel better i'm still not apologizing in my head for the thing that i wasn't really sorry i said I'm sorry you reacted the way you did. That I'm sorry about, you know, but I'm not necessarily sorry for what I did because, you know, and it just may not be. Mm -hmm. And certainly it's, it's circumstantial and it depends on the situation, obviously. And, and, but I think that there are situations where you don't have to make yourself a doormat to just make your partner happy. And you really didn't do anything wrong, but there was miscommunication or, you know, that, that might be a better way to, to phrase it is like, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for this miscommunication. Like this is actually what I meant. I'm sorry that it, it came out in a way that you, you, you know, took it in this way, but right. Let me be clear of what I meant. Sorry about the miscommunication. Yeah. In in an emotionally, you know, manipulative relationship, a lot of times there's this grooming to just constantly have one of the individuals be apologizing for every breath that they take. Right. Right. And so I I definitely see where that's, um, where that's slippery. Gets into trouble. And also even, you can even get into trouble because the miscommunication, now you're trying to prove your point. This is what I meant. Like, let me show you how I'm really not wrong. Mm. Where you can just cut out that and just say, oh, I'm so sorry you're hurt. Yeah. What do you need from me right now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That changes the whole trajectory of it. For yeah. Sure. It's a simple question, but it yeah. can can do a lot of good in cert- certainly in charged conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been such a treat. Uh, this has been just a rich conversation and we're super, super grateful for you uh, sharing your wisdom and experience. You know, maybe maybe let the listeners know where where they can find more of you. Obviously, get your book um, if they want to work with you. Uh, what what are some of the best resources for getting in touch with you? And, and um, my website, nancypicardlifecoach dot com. You can sign up for a free call with me. You can buy my book online. You can see all the different things I do. All my podcasts go up there. Uh, but I'm also following me. I love to be followed on Instagram and Facebook. Nancy Picard Life Coaches does it. And um, yeah, that's it. I've had a lot of fun too. And Jared wears that same shirt. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it yours? <laughs> shout out to no, it's Cal Callahan, the, uh, the, oh, the yeah. Great Unlearn podcast. So shout I out. Spend, I spend my first five minutes trying to figure out what does it say? <laughs> <laughs> right. Jared wears the same one. Yeah. 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 I love those guys down there in the Austin community. Yep. Yeah. Um, Where are you guys? We're in San Diego. Oh, well, yeah. mm-hmm. so you're near Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Paul. Yeah. We're headed up to see Paul this couple, weekend. This weekend. Yeah. 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 Well, well, the last question that we ask every guest, the medicine is all about, like I said before, developing conscious relationships with every aspect in every aspect of our life and really leaning into the medicines that help us do that. And so we would like to know from you, what currently feels like medicine in your life right now? Actually, always being outside every day in nature and using my tools, 
like using the tools in my own relationship so that I then, well, number one, I know they work, but also it's like when I can get anxious or I can get upset or triggered, I will think to myself, you're a coach. Like, yeah, you do this every day. What would you tell your client right now? Yeah. That is my medicine. So mm. staying in integrity with the work is my medicine. That's mm. so good. I'm so glad you do that. And and we certainly try to do that as well. I think it's so important for anyone who's in any sort of teaching or coaching or mentoring capacity is to constantly, as your son taught us, to constantly be stalking yourself and yeah. self-reflecting in every moment of relating to whatever. We have to constantly stalk ourselves and just, you know, sometimes just like take a breath and ask like, huh, I wonder why that's happening right now. Like even just that is so powerful and just giving yourself a second to coach yourself through the moment rather than being reactive mm -hmm. is, is be the so observer. Yeah. It's all about being the observer, Michael Sinner. Yeah. 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 So good. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It was so much fun. Sharing your work and your wisdom with us. We absolutely enjoyed it. And I'm sure we will um, connect with you later on. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It was great. A lot of fun. All right, you guys, check the show notes for all the uh, links. Check out her book. And if this this conversation resonated with you, check out her website. She has so much information on there. It's a really great resource. We will talk to you next time. Go spread some light. Okay, bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed that, check out right over here for some more fun clips. Oh, and you're going to want to subscribe. Bye.